this service of Lenten devotional. Thanks for braving the weather and for continuing our Lenten journey on this evening. Welcome. May we begin with a prayer. As you have awakened us this morning, O God, so have you spoken our name with that familiarity and that love that is only found in your voice. As we continue this Lenten journey and move ever so closer to the celebration of resurrection, we know that we also move closer to that agony of Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, which we must endure before we can truly know and grasp the celebration of resurrection. So as we continue this journey of examination, continue to be our partner, our guide, as we show ourselves to you, and you show yourself to us. In your presence we pray, and in your name we ask. Amen. Our hymn is 357, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. Let's stand as we sing together.
Tonight, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, indicate <clears throat> Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. See how they speak to you tonight. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May God have add his blessing to the reading of Holy Scripture. <laughs> Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. Invites us to this time of silence and repentance. And so may we, in our own way, in our own quietness, reflect our own prayers that we bring to God this evening.
heard the prayers of our hearts, O God. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Do not worry about your life. <laughs> Surely Jesus didn't really intend that. He couldn't mean something that profound as simply as, do not worry about your life. What would he say to a woman who has recently been widowed? What would he say to millions who wrestle with cancer, AIDS, heart disease, diabetes? What would he say to those who struggle to feed their children? Can he really mean it when the threat of foreclosure and bankruptcy and student loans stares upon so many people? Could he really mean it when war is a constant threat to many people's way of life? When earthquakes and floods devastate everything in their path? Surely this isn't what he means. Do not worry about your life. Have faith is the simple response. Well, is faith like a red telephone to ensure that God, like a superhero, will swoop in with his red cape and save us whenever we get into trouble? Is it the reorientation of our lives to something else? Maybe to God's purpose, to God's values and God's priorities. Could it be this take no worry of your life? Could that be giving up trust in our own resources and opening ourselves to be willing to embrace a new and trusted way of living? Faith is opening ourselves to trust Christ's life, to seek God's way of justice and hope. Because it says, if we do this, all things will be added to us. Worry will be a thing of the past, and we'll know the freedom of His support and His encouragement. But is it possible to live a worry-free life? Can faith really make that at all a thing of possibility? A recent Chicago Tribune poll of expressway drivers revealed the not-so-surprising information that one-third of us are now talking on the phone as we drive. I wonder what happened to the other four-fifths who did not admit to talking on the phone as they drive, as they drove. Forty percent of us are drinking coffee at that time. Twenty-five percent of those interviewed said they eat an entire meal in their car. Furthermore, it said that twelve percent did an angry or obscene gesture in the stress of expressway driving. It even has a name. It's called multitasking, doing it as many things simultaneously as possible, and perhaps never enjoying any one very much at all. There's a new book called The Acceleration of Almost Everything by James Clyke. And it comment, it documents with wit a sobering candor, a phenomenon that we're all caught. 
He says that everything is in fact accelerating. It isn't your imagination. You are busier than you used to be. A lot busier than anyone who has lived before you. You're working more hours, sleeping a lot less, eating on the run. It's called, created a whole new vocabulary, techno stress, hurry sickness, data smog, internet addiction, telephone tag, voicemail hell, cyber phobia, email spam, and of course, the, old, the, one, the one multitasking, which is defined as you don't just do one thing at a time anymore. Like reports that Americans are buying shampoo that reduces hair drying time by 30%. Instead of punching the numbers 90 into the microwave, it takes less time to punch the numbers 88. So that's what people do. And I've long suspected that but it's now been revealed that those closed door buttons on elevators aren't actually connected to anything. They don't really close the door. They just help you feel you're doing something. <laughs> so, can any of you add a single hour to your span of life is a profound issue. We give it our best shot, don't we? We're doing our best to squeeze every minute of the time it, that we have, to pack it all in, to do it all. And in actuality, that's evidence of a spiritual problem. Take no thought of your life. Do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds, the lilies. God knows what you need. I've often thought that either these are the most important or the silliest words that Jesus ever said. If you watch the birds, you know they're not worrying. They're spending every waking moment working at coming up with food and shelter. As one writer says, look at the birds, 80% of the robins die each year from thirst and hunger. To be human is to worry. We worry a lot. And we do what we can to resolve our worries, to secure our futures against whatever things might happen. And it's precisely at that point that Jesus catches us with the admonition that sounds at once profound and silly. Don't worry, God will give you what you need. Too often anxiety determines a lot of what we do. Walter Brueggemann tells the story of friends who had a four-year-old daughter. Recently the mother said they had to make an important decision. She had to get her son into the right kindergarten because if she didn't, he wouldn't make it into the right prep school. And that meant not getting into the right college. If he, if he did not go to school there, he wouldn't be connected to the bankers and be able to get the kind of job where a lot of money would be made possible. We're expert worriers. Frederick Buechner tells us that telling us not to worry is like telling a person with a head cold not to sneeze. Don't worry. Don't worry. Jesus is clear. Do not worry about what you will wear, about our security, about our loved ones. 
Because as long as we're worried, we're inclined to give our anxieties the power to shape and form the way that we live. And that's called sin. Giving someone or something other than God the power to, to shape and form our lives is just that. It's sinful. Jesus declared it silly for birds to live with concern over their basic needs. So does he imply that just as God has cared for those creatures, has not God cared for us in the past, in the present? And no amount of worry about our future or about our security will make us more secure. Not even our skill, our bank account, our stunning good looks can protect us with a sense of peace and wholeness. No amount of worry will provide that kind of outcome. And to think that worry has the ability as a sinful part of our lives will only leave us more frustrated and more empty. The passage opens with the admonition that we cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus isn't referring to great psalms of money. Rather, Jesus is talking about a money-centered approach to life's needs. Trust cannot be found in things an external security, but only in a life of faith. Well, when we worry, at least we feel we're doing something. Surely it will help. But to say that worry is sin may even add another layer of guilt. I know I shouldn't worry. I realize it's counterproductive. But at least it's doing something. Well, could we say that worry is often nothing but a bad habit, like biting our nails or pacing when we're nervous or forgetting to snap our seatbelt? One of the most helpful books I've read lately is called The Power of Habit, and it talks about destructive habits and how they work in our lives. The author, Charles Duhigg, says, All of our life... All our life is nothing but a mass of habits. Most of the choices that we make each day feel like the products of well-considered decision-making. But they aren't. They're habit. And each habit re means relatively little on its own. The meals we order, what we say to our children at night, how we save, how we spend, how we exercise, how we organize our thoughts. One paper published by Duke University found that over 40% of the actions that people performed each day weren't actual decisions, but habits. So, while worrying constitutes sin, Perhaps it could also be considered a habit. If we decided consciously that we're going to break old habits and make new habits, couldn't we decide to break the habit of worry and replace it with something more useful, something more in line with God's best for our lives? How do you break a habit? You monitor it. You pay attention to how it infects your life. If you want to stop an annoying habit, like biting your nails or swearing, you begin by taking note of how often you do those things. Even elicit a friend to help you notice. You monitor it. Instead of swearing, you say, Go I you, or whatever. <laughs> Instead of worrying, repeat something like a Bible verse. When I am afraid or worry, I will trust in God. Write your worries down. Put them in a basket and consider that God's basket to deal with. 
J. Arthur Rank, an English executive, decided to do all of his worrying one day a week. So he chose Wednesdays when anything happened that gave him anxiety. He would write it down and put it in his worry box and vow not to worry until Wednesday. The interesting thing was that on the following Wednesday when he opened his worry box, he found most of the things that had disturbed him for the last six days were already settled. It would have been useless to have worried about them. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink or wear. Strive first for God's right way of living. <coughs> And all these things will be given to you as well. Anxiety-free living is the realization that in every circumstance, the Lord is near. The Lord is greater than any sum of troubles that come our way. It's common for some cultures to name their son Jesus. And there was a church whose janitor was named Jesus. One evening after a long day at work, the pastor noticed his office door had been left open. When he got to the door, he saw that the janitor had painted the door frame and left the door open so the fresh paint would not be disturbed. And on the wall next to the door, the janitor had written a note, Dear Sir, please do not close the door. And it was signed, Jesus. In the note, do you not think there's a message to us as well? Not from Jesus, but from Jesus. Please do not close the door. Do not let the anxieties of the current crisis blind us to the very one in whom our only hope lies. Don't close the door on Jesus. Amen. Our hymn is, I have, I've got Peace Like a River, number 368. sharing to the best of our ability the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. With God's help, we will, 
So go then in peace and joy with the blessing of the companion God around you, upon you, and within you, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.